Tower 311 Spring Street, Block 16, Lot 4.01. This is PV-2023-06. The applicant proposes to demolish the existing parking deck located on the property and to construct a 30-story mixed-use development with 342 residential units consisting of 25 studios, uh, 246 one-bedroom and 71 two-bedroom units. Of the 246 units, 69 or 20% will be affordable units. The building proposes to include a ground floor with 1,718 square feet of retail unit, a residential lobby, amenities, and a parking garage with 112 spaces. Parking will, be additional, uh, will additionally be provided in the adjacent Spring Street parking garage owned by the applicant's affiliate. Representation by Thomas Kelso, Esquire. Uh, thank you, members of the board. Thomas Kelso on behalf of the applicant. Um, I won't repeat everything that the chair just said because I take extra three minutes. But uh, the applicant technically is 11 Spring Street Urban Renewal LLC. Uh, that is a limited liability company that is a, a subsidiary of Boreyad Development. Uh, Boreyad Development, as you know, is a very well-known developer within the state of New Jersey, but particularly here in uh, New Brunswick, and has had a number of successful projects, particularly residential projects. So I'm proud to be before you this evening representing them, uh, but also uh, more so as to the nature of this project and the magnitude of it, and we think how it will uh, have a very positive impact on the downtown of the city of Brunswick. Uh, as um, <clears throat> the chair mentioned, uh, along uh, with the overall number of units, 20% of the units will be affordable housing units. We think that that's always a positive addition to any new residential project that uh, we see coming uh, into the downtown. Uh, particularly in this case, uh, where we're located so close to the train station, and of course we're all very familiar with what's going uh, now just starting to be developed uh, adjacent to us, which is the first building of the hub project, uh, which is the Helix building, <coughs> being developed by New Brunswick Development Corporation. Um, my client is the designated redeveloper for this project. Uh, this <clears throat> project and the concept were approved by the Housing Authority of the City acting as the redevelopment agency uh, in accordance with the NB Downtown Redevelopment Area Plan. Uh, and as designated redeveloper, my client has entered into a redevelopment agreement uh, with the Housing Authority, uh, which entity does monitor the development and all the obligations that a developer has with respect to the development of any project such as this. Uh, the, um, <clears throat> I think it's important for the board to know up front that this uh, proposed plan that you have before you this evening is fully compliant with the redevelopment plan. Uh, there are certain things that obviously we think it's are important for you to see in terms of the detail and to understand and to answer questions from the public, but it is a fully compliant plan. The only thing that we're looking for the board's consideration are four design waivers. And these design waivers are things that you've seen many times. Uh, and I just want to point them out for the record. <clears throat> there is a uh, two-way driveway width of 30 feet, whereas 36 is required. Uh, that's a result of the, that's the ingress and egress point into the garage from Church Street. And again, it's a common uh, waiver that, we, that I know that we've seen in the past. Uh, there is an idle width waiver in the parking facility itself. Of, and this is not the Spring Street garage, but that's already built. Uh, but I believe that also got the waivers many years ago. But this is for the new garage that's going to be built on the, the ground levels of the new building. And that's a driveway uh, aisle width of 22 feet versus the 24 feet that's required. So it's a two feet differential. And again, we've seen that as a waiver many, in many projects that we've had, uh, both done by my client, other developers, and even the parking authority. Uh, there is a parking stall waiver of some of these spaces will be less than nine by 18. And I think you've seen that commonly in garages, particularly the parking authority. Uh, that <clears throat> vary less than 9 by 18, many are 8.5 by 18 or even less. 
uh, and I'll let the engineer speak to that or the architect um, <clears throat> as to, and that's certainly not all the spaces, but there's a series of those spaces. Uh, and lastly, there is a waiver for the landscaping and buffering requirements along the street frontages. Um, and that's just a blanket waiver because if you recognize and you've seen what we're talking about, there's no location for landscaping and buffering because it's in the downtown, it's right up against the right of way uh, and is consistent with what's being developed around it. Uh, there are the potential to have street trees uh, that really we're not including in that buffer. Uh, and I'll let the, the engineer speak to that, but it's something that we'll work with the city on as to where and how street trees can be located. <clears throat> but it would still require that landscaping and buffering waiver. Those are the four waivers that uh, we're asking the board to consider. I would indicate to you, again, they're, they're fairly common that we've seen in most every project that's been developed, particularly with those designs in parking garages. Uh, but again, fully compliant plan with all the major components of the ND uh, downtown redevelopment plan. Uh, but that is an overview. I would just let you know we're going to be calling three witnesses, our architect, our civil engineer, and our traffic consultant uh, for your consideration. Uh, and if there are no questions for me at this point in time, I would call Mr. Michael Higgins for testimony. Mr. Kelso, just one moment. I just want to verify that no board member has a conflict with this application just before we get going. Seeing none, thank you. Um, Mr. Higgins, you're a licensed architect for the state of New Jersey and other states, is that correct? Yes, since 1994. And in that capacity, you've been responsible for and are familiar with the architectural components of this building and the proposed development? Yes, very much. Okay. Swerving. Yes, sir. Can you please state your name, spell your last name for the record? Michael Higgins, H-I-G-G-I-S. Do you swear or affirm to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Yes. Everything you just previously said, assume you were under it. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> I think uh, as an overview, what I'd like you to do, rather than me ask you specific questions, I'd ask you to go through generally uh, the overall components of building, uh, the design specific uh, items that I think are important for the public to, to see and for the board. Uh, and feel free to use reference to the exhibits. Now what we'll do is for exhibits that were previously submitted as part of the package, we don't mark those, but many times we have uh, renderings or photos and those usually were not included in the package to the, to the uh, planning office and we mark those separately. Right. So we do, I have a set of... Mr. Higgins, before you begin, yes. your credentials are in good standing? Yes, they are. So we will accept these in a credit. Thank you very much. Proceed. Okay. Uh, this season will be a set of the drawings that were submitted. We have uh, in the plan application, the architectural portion. Okay. And then could you just I, skew yeah. them a little bit towards the public as yes. well? Were the colorized renderings submitted or were they black? No, the, the, co the colorized renderings that are on this are, we have some larger versions of those that would be exhibits that would be on the other side. Okay, so these were submitted previously. These were. Yeah, that's that's okay. Yeah. okay. So I'll go through some of the facts again to read them into the record. So this is a new mixed-use building, 30 stories. It's at the corner of Spring and Church Streets on the site of the existing garage. It has 342 residential units, and I'll go into some of the detail of what type of units. This view that's shown as this exhibit is looking at the corner of Church and Spring Streets. And we mark that wasn't previously provided, correct? It actually is in a small version. Yeah, it's, it's in a smaller version in the set. So this is a larger version of our version that's on the second page. Okay. I'm just, I'm just going to let you let me know whether there's one that wasn't sure. submitted. Sure. They were all, all on the unit. Just to change with the, with the treasure. Yeah, Basically. okay. That's right. Okay. So uh, this is uh, what we're referring to as Spring Street Tower 3. Uh, the block and lot is block 16, lot 4.01. It's in the NV or the Brunswick Downtown Redevelopment Plan. The lot area is 23,980 square feet. The building coverage is 79.3%. The 
the building height is 300 feet uh, from the average grade. Uh, the building gross floor area is 427,334 square feet. Of that, the residential floor area is 267,587 square feet. There is a corner uh, commercial space uh, that is 1,718 square feet. Uh, the base of the building is, includes the residential lobby, which is oriented towards the train street on Spring Street, the corner retail, the garage entrance, and the loading all occur along Church Street, and I'll show you that on the ground floor plan when we go through it so you can see how the building functions. Uh, the base is a screened parking garage, structured parking garage, and then the residential units begin on the fifth floor up to the 29th floor with an amenity roof deck and amenity space on the top floor. Uh, there is also two two-story amenity spaces on the fifth floor and on the seventh floor that service the building. And again, I'll walk you through the plans to show you some of that. Um, let me just show all the different aspects and maybe I can turn some of these to face the public. This is the view from the uh, New Brunswick train station looking at the building. So this shows the lobby entrance and also the green wall associated with the lobby that's part of the uh, screen of the uh, parking garage. There's a metal panel that screens the rest of the parking garage and then the residential building above that. And then the third view is from the north side of the building showing the Albany Street Plaza office buildings in front and the, the, the building uh, viewed from more of the river, the Rarity River side. You'll see Spring Street Tower behind there, or Spring Street. Um, what I'd love to do now is these are the same exhibits and there's some more statistics about the building on the first page. So out of the 342 residential units that occur on floors 5 through 29, you have 25 studios, which is 7%. 246 one bedrooms, which is 72%, 71% two bedrooms, which is 21%. So that's the mix of units, studios, ones, and two bedrooms. There are outdoor common terraces on floors five through 30, and then there's private terraces and balconies on floors five through 29. Within the parking garage, which is on the ground floor, second, third, and fourth floors, there are 112 parking spaces uh, out of that, there are 18 electric charging stations. Uh, at the ground floor, there is also 80 bike parking facility. I'm going to turn us through some of the pages. These are the other renderings that you've already seen that were included in. So all those renderings are part of the, uh, the original submission. They're just larger versions of it. At the corner, there's a small basement that's used for utility space and some storage. Uh, that's located very close to the corner of Spring and Church. The ground floor is comprised of the building's lobby, which is, you'll see a revolving door and two entry doors. This was where the green wall was. This is the office building in gray. This is the alleyway that services the back of the office building coming off a of church street. The main lobby includes the vertical circulation, four elevators, stairwell, package room, mail room, security room, and also the fire command center, some storage rooms. The garage, the, the retail space located on the corner will be entered from Spring Street and is, again, 1,718 square feet. It also has direct access to the loading, which is off of Church Street. That loading allows access to a vestibule which uh, for move-ins and deliveries to the back of the elevator that goes up to the residential portion of the building. There's a trash room off the loading dock, so all the residential trash comes down into this holding area and comes out to the loading dock in this car to lay. The office building had its existing trash coming out on the street, along Spring Street. There will now be a gate and a paved uh, sidewalk that goes down two doors that will cut through into the garage and allow the trash to be contained there and then taken out through the same opening in the, uh, in the loading dock. This drawing is an exhibit.
This is a new, this is something that was not, one of the comments from engineering was how to address the trash removal from the office building. And so we made an adjustment by adding these doors through this space and the small sidewalk area between the garage and the office building. Uh, the garage entrance is here off of Church Street. You circulate through the garage, upper ramp to all the different levels. There's some, also some utility rooms located along the ground floor. The if bikes. You mark that. Yeah, if you, if you mark that as an exhibit, uh, sorry. There's only one A1. 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 If you can put the date as well. Thank you. And are, we, are we going to revise ground floor plan? Yes. Second floor has two-story spaces above the retail and above the main lobby. And then there's a leasing office that's located above the package room that allows for some to look over into the main lobby space. The garage second floor ramp continues up. There's, there's some amenity spaces, uh, sorry, some mechanical spaces located in the corner. Again, the third floor of the garage, full parking level with some mechanical spaces. The fourth level is the top level of the garage, all parking spaces here as well, and you'll see the electric charging stations have all been located at that The fifth floor is the first residential floor. It's comprised of 12 residential units, and the roof of the garage uh, has some terrace space, and there's an amenity, a two-story amenity space that's 1,751 square feet. These units stack as they go up through the building. So on the sixth floor, you have the same floor plan and just a void where the two-story space for the amenity is, same units. And then on the seventh floor plan, you have the second two-story amenity space and 12 residential units. This is the eighth floor plan that shows the two-story of that seventh floor amenity space. The amenity spaces now are planned to be uh, both health and wellness spaces, gyms, exercise uh, equipment. Uh, there will be some uh, co-working areas for people to work from home remotely, have access to Wi-Fi and those kind of things. And then there will be a mixture of active and quiet sitting areas in different parts of the building. This is the 9th through 29th floor plan, which has the same 14 units now. The two units that were dropped off to have amenity spaces have now been ba added back in, and those are all the way to the top. Again, the four elevators service the entire building and the two stairways. The corners at the uh, northeast and uh, what would you call the south, southeast corners have private balconies to allow some articulation. We'll talk more about the facade. And then the 30th floor is an amenity space, 3,555 square feet, has a large outdoor amenity roof deck. Uh, with rooftop pavers, uh, and then some screen mechanical room and another small terrace to take advantage of some of the views. Uh, the building facades, so maybe I'll use, the, the building facades are a mixture of, if this is a tower on a base type of project, the, the base of the building has a mixture of glass and metal panels, and also some uh, stone panels, and then brick as well. The upper portion of the building has an articulated light gray metal framework that has a two-story read to it, and then the building itself has some formal moves where it angles along Spring Street to break up some of the mass of that long facade, and then there's steps along Church Street to allow for a little bit of play of light and to break down the overall massing of the building. Elevations, but I think you see it a little bit better in the regular. The, um, the section shows the small basement along Spring and Church, and then the building stacking all the way up. The building is 300 feet tall, above three. Um, 
some of the critical dimensions of the ground floor of the building is separated from the, uh, these are some of the unit layouts that show the different configuration of the units. These are, all the units will be the same, the affordables and the, uh, the market rate units, and they're all standard and, and similar to what we do in, in, in other buildings. At the ground floor, the distance between the garage and the building is four foot eight to allow access for the trash to come out from the, uh, uh, from the office building. Uh, above, the tower is 28 feet from the office building and 54 foot nine. Because it's sort of a T-shaped uh, type of plan, so there's some different uh, dimensions of the setback. So 28 feet at the narrow part and 50, 50, 54 foot nine. the angled facade, the uh, light gray framework that surround the windows in a two-story reading to get a play of light. We have the two-story or four-story reading of the amenity spaces in that uh, portion of the building and the green wall near the entry. Um, I think that concludes my testimony. Let me, uh, let me just <clears throat> ask you a few questions about trash pickup, delivery, and move in, move out. I know you referenced it briefly, but I'm sure there are questions about it. So yep. you want to be able to understand the movements for um, access to the garage for, sure. for minor trash pickup. Like for, uh, so off of Church Street, you have the loading dock entry opposite the, uh, the garage, uh, and, the, and then you have the garage entrance as well. So the utilities are coming off of here. They face the Spring Street <coughs> garage as well. So you have the entrance to the garage, for the Spring Street garage, and you have the entrance for our garage on the similar portion of the street. Uh, loading, uh, the trash comes down, the trash chute is compacted and stored in this room, then it would come out to the loading dock and get carted away. The in 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 ingress and egress from the parking garage is here along Spring Street through this uh, secure, controlled garage. The garage will have access control, will have cameras, will have uh, fobs to control the in and out of the garage to make sure it's a secure and safe garage. And uh, the trash is private right now? Yes. Uh, just one more question, maybe to back up. You referred to a few times the green wall. Could you tell us what you mean by green wall? Yes. So a green wall is a system, sometimes we do in urban areas where we're challenged to get some greenery in different places due to either infrastructure below or above, but it's a system with a, a metal mesh and then you have plant materials that are made to grow up the, the screen and they, they start with a, with a nice thing. But it's sort of like an, an ivy, but it's a mixture of plants that are made particularly well suited to growing up these sort of vertical walls. And it just adds a nice little character. There's a few that have been very successful that we've seen in Newark and other places that have been very uh, popular. And as a component of something, you actually place these It's a system. It's, yeah, a it's system. a system that people have figured out the best plants, the way to grow them. And, it's not Sam going after No. <laughs> uh, I have uh, no further questions for uh, Mr. Higgins. The board wishes to direct that. Do any board members have any questions? Uh, just so for clarity, it's a little difficult for me to see. Yep. So all of the um, all the aggressive she was talking about with the trash pickup, that's all happening off of Spring Street. Church Street. Church, 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 church. church. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so this is Spring? Yeah. Kind of plan, and then this is church. Okay, and then obviously you brought your traffic study person with you that's going to talk about the impact of that on that particularly narrow road, yes. essentially backing traffic up through George and down the east. Yeah, essentially that's the same location where the driveway is now. Yeah. Right, it's just nowhere near exactly. Yeah. As he's and, proposing the, it to be. and again, just to clarify, the trash truck actually pulls into the building. Yes, into the loading dock. So, to right, the Again, just to make sure that there is a parking garage, a parking deck there now. Yeah, 100%. There's an existing structure there. That's what it's for. Nobody lives above. So <laughs> now you're inviting uh, significantly more traffic to that space. There's that kind of one road. It's a one way. It then becomes the entrance in the spring hanging a left, or if you're going back to Albany hanging a right. If you clog that up, it goes down through George, all the way back to Nielsen, all the way to Nielsen, and then the next available turn is going to be uh, spacing on this. Bayard Street, and you have to do a weird sort of loop around.
around. So I'm just hoping that this guy can speak specifically to that. Those are my questions. Okay. Mr. Kelso, you did mention move in, move out. What's the vision for, does that happen street side or in the, in the depth? In the loading space. In the loading space. So the truck would pull in and has access to a secure vestibule and then access to a front and back elevator. So it all can happen in that, outside that area. And, and moving is, a, is only scheduled. Yep. So yes. people have a window of maybe three hours to come in and move in and move out. That's the way most of the, the buildings are done. No, I just wanted to clarify that they had access to that uh, yeah. driveway. So. Bob? Yeah, I'm assuming all of the amenity spaces that you referred to are amenities for the uh, tenants of the building. Is it, is, are there any amenities uh, built into this project for new runs of residents, public spaces, or anything like that? Uh, the retail component or the commercial component, depending on what that comes, is often viewed as an amenity to the neighborhood and the building itself, depending on who gets in there. This building covers a lot. Uh, so the question is, the, the retail component has use of the parking deck as part of the retail scenario, is that for customers as well? Not for customers. The, the expectation of the retail at 1,700 square feet is largely retail that you're going to have people walk to because you're going to be servicing the Helix project across the street. Yeah, of uh, course. Absolutely. I've seen that restaurants tend to do better with this parking associated. Depends on where they're located. 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 Depends. Also fair. There are restaurants that I'll park and walk. Is the vision for the parking to be like assigned spaces to specific unit owners or open parking? I'm, or I'm, going, to, I'm going to allow our traffic consultant to speak to that, but I would say generally, as you know, this, this plan provides for the utilization of the the uh, excess parking that exists in the one Spring Street garage. There's, there's significant uh, vacancy in it. The, the new garage, which is essentially replacing the old garage, and the Spring Street garage, there'll be a combination between the two. There'll be some residents that okay. may be in the garage underneath the building, they may be in Spring Street. Some of the office may end up in, Spring, in the Spring Street garage or underneath here. Uh, whether or not they'll have assigned spaces, they'll have monthly leases, like all of the other garages where you do a, a monthly lease. I don't think, not, I could let Sam speak to this, but I don't believe the expectation is to have specific assigned spaces. No. Okay. Which, which is currently the case in the Spring Street, rather not specifically assigned spaces. Uh, any further questions for Mr. Hayden? Anyone on the board? How about my board professionals? Mr. Chairman, if I may just pretty quickly, um, the, the, the trash vehicle is going to drive into the, the trash room. Yes. Or trash room, the SU-30 type trash for the little right. garbage truck. Uh, same thing for, for recycling? Yes. Separate vehicle, I presume, would go in there and also pick up the recycling? Mm -hmm. This time I would call Mr. Dan Doherty for testimonies. Is that correct? That's correct since 1999. And in that capacity, you're familiar with the plan itself, but particularly with regard to the civil engineering aspects. Absolutely. Uh, could you give the board the benefit of your professional qualifications and experience? I'm a graduate of Villanova University with a bachelor's of civil engineering, licensed engineer in the state of New Jersey since 1999. I've actually appear, appeared before this board on one other occasion. Um, I've uh, been accepted as a witness before other boards, I'd say, over 100 boards throughout New Jersey. We'll accept you as an expert. Thank you. Thank you. If you could, uh, then, Mr. Dobby, just the uh, same way we handled uh, the architect, just.
give us an overview of the engineering components. I realize the building essentially takes up the site, so that eliminates some testimony, but uh, just give us a sense of the utilities and the other, the other particular civil engineering aspects. I do have an exhibit that I'd like to read um, in. So this is exhibit A2, it's entitled Site Plan Rendering, and it's prepared by Dynamic Engineering Consultants, dated October 2nd, 2023. Um, this is essentially a colored version of the, of the site plan sheet that you have in your packets. Um, with the limited site improvements here, we're really just limited to coloring in the different pavement textures and the building. Um, the building is shown as this um, kind of a, a dark orange color on the southwest um, uh, side of this block. So we're, our location is block 16, lot 4.01. Um, the orientation of this exhibit is generally north is up. Um, we're at the southwest corner, lower left corner of the, of the block 16 block at the intersection of Church Street and Spring Street. Um, um, really, I, I'll just explain the general um, um, existing and proposed improvements along our frontage. In existing conditions, uh, we have the parking deck that exits out into Church Street. There's four uh, metered parking stalls along Church Street. Um, and then as Church Street turns to Spring Street to go, to, go towards the north, there's a, a blank pavement area that's actually within the site, within the site property in existing conditions. Um, and what we'll propose to do is raise the entire uh, parking garage and build a new structure that Mr. Higgins described for you. Um, along uh, Spring Street, we're gonna continue the existing curb line coming south from the alignment um, near, near uh, Albany Street and continue that alignment all the way up to the corner. Um, and then it'll wrap onto Church Street with generally the same curve alignment that's there now. Uh, the parking access uh, is a slightly different location than the existing parking garage access, and we also have the loading access. So we will have to modify the on street parking locations. We'll coordinate that with the parking authority as would be expected. Uh, on the Spring Street frontage, uh, there's a, a pull-in that allows for a drop-off and pickup, Uber rides, etc., um, off of Spring Street, and that's the front door location for, for the building, that, for the lobby, and, and for the building for residential access, aside from the internal access. Uh, Spring Street's two-way. It'll remain two-way, the same orientation that it was changed to with the recent improvements. Uh, Church Street is one way in a westbound direction. At the southwest corner, um, your planner had, had called out that there was a call out in the redevelopment plan for a bump out at this corner um, to be really a, a, a bit of a traffic calming element, uh, so we'll accomplish that as well. Um, we're proposing limited lighting on the site. We have um, overstory building on the sidewalk frontage on Spring Street that will be lit within the soffit of the, of the ceiling of that level. Um, that will all be accomplished with with, uh, part, as part of the architectural design. And we'll have wall-mounted fixtures along our alleyway and also around Church Street. I forgot to mention, we have an alleyway on our east side. This alleyway goes back to serve 120 Albany Street at, the, at their rear door. Um, and that same alleyway and access is gonna be retained. There's also an easement uh, off-site to serve the fire escapes for our next door neighbor on Church Street. That alleyway and easement access our alley, and that's going to be maintained throughout construction so that there's always access to that element. And, and the same for 120 Albany Street. This alleyway will be maintained throughout construction uh, to make sure that there's always access. No change in the existing. No change in the existing. <coughs> um, so, from a lighting perspective, we'll have wall mounted lights. We'll provide the lighting analysis that your planner and engineer asked for to show that we can form with the uh, minimum standards of the city standards and that will be no problem, as well as the internal parking garage. Uh, it was requested that we provide lighting for the internal parking garage and, and that as well will be provided. From a signage perspective, we're proposing signs um, on the uh, Church Street frontage near the southwest corner and then we'll have two signs on the Spring Street frontage, one for the retail element which is at the southwest corner and then another for the uh, 
for the residential element. Uh, they'll be conforming to the ordinance. Uh, there's no relief that we're requesting. Uh, they'll be within the 10% um, that's allowed for the 10% of the facade for each of those elements. Um, we have almost the entire site's impervious coverage. In existing conditions, the entire site is impervious coverage. It's entirely the garage and the alleyway. Um, we do have a strip of uh, about 4.7 feet between us and the building um, that's fronting on Albany Street. Uh, we I propose that to be a low maintenance, you know, river stone, landscape stone kind of treatment to allow for it to act as impervious co as pervious coverage, uh, but also to be a low maintenance element. It really doesn't see much from the public view. Um, that will be amended slightly because we'll bring a sidewalk in for about half of that length to allow for that trash access um, that Mr. Higgins had discussed from, tact, from lot 11.01, .01, uh, the existing trash door at the back of 11.01, .01, where now cans line up at this location for pickup. They'll be brought uh, about halfway back, back our building and then into the building to share our trash room. <coughs> So we will have a little bit more impervious coverage. I think we're at 96%. We'll probably be at 98% or something like that when we're done. Again, still a reduction in impervious. Um, um, we meet all the stormwater management regulations uh, because we are a reduction in impervious coverage. Um, let's see. From a landscape perspective, uh, obviously we have very, very little opportunity for landscape. Uh, we are asking for the relief from the buffer, and, as Mr. Kelso had indicated. Uh, we will propose and work with the city to the city's professionals to add some street trees along our frontage. We're, we're limited a little bit on, on the portion of our frontage that has the building over, over the sidewalk, but we do have some spots at the northeast, uh, northwest corner and then maybe some spots along Church Street. Um, in the event we can't meet that ordinance requirement, we agree to the ordinance allowance for uh, payment in lieu of plantings. Um, from a utility perspective, um, we'll have gas and electric utilities uh, provided by PSE&G. Um, the, the utility company in that case is going to determine the exact locations. Uh, right now we would expect we'll probably get service off of our Church Street frontage for electric and probably get gas off of the Spring Street frontage. But again, that's really just conceptual at this point. Um, we have uh, set expected sanitary sewer connection to an existing manhole in Spring Street and expected uh, water service connections at the southwest corner uh, into Church Street. Uh, both of those are, are a little bit firm, more firm than the PSEG connections, but of course, you know, they'll go through a full review with, um, with the Township Utility Department, Water and Sewer Department. Uh, each of those will require TWA and BWSE and JDEP permits because of the volume that we have, um, but that's a pretty minor permit for this element. Uh, there was a comment uh, from the Township Engineer about uh, replacing water main in along our frontage in Church Street and the clients amenable to that as well. Uh, there was one comment also um, from your engineer about um, the existing drain that's down in this corner near the door for Albany Street or for 120 Albany Street. So this alleyway um, that feeds this doorway, this doorway is actually lower than the elevation of Church Street. So the grade slopes down towards that door and there's an existing inlet here. This inlet is served by the plumbing inside our parking garage in existing conditions. So we'll be rerouting that inlet to a permanent um, direction uh, to help to, to continue to drain the alley um, and also to continue during, during construction and in proposed conditions. We'll probably also add um, an inlet in this alleyway, the stone alleyway between the two buildings to, sh to short circuit any runoff that would come down through the stone alley to that same inlet in the corner. Um, we want to minimize the load on that, on that inlet. I think that's all I have from an engineering perspective. Um, I think um, um, as far as the review comments that we received from the board planner and the engineer, I think we're in agreement with everything that's in there. Um, there were some questions uh, that were in those letters that I tried to hit during testimony. If anything came up that I missed, feel free to let me know. Um, there are only two elements that were in, in the letter that, I, that there's a, a difference in um, after having looked at the ordinance requirements. Um, both were in regard to the need for additional, par additional parking access, a dual access uh, to our parking deck. 
Um, we reviewed the ordinance. I, I spoke um, with, with your engineer as well about it. And he was in agreement as well that those sections of the ordinance really apply to ground level parking. Um, so they don't, wouldn't apply to the parking deck. Um, so I don't believe there's any weakness for those. But otherwise, I think we agree with all the comments that were requested of us. I would just uh, ask just a couple things. Just to expand on the, the uh, water utility line in Church Street, I think that uh, we've, we, for the record, we are agreeing to be responsible for that uh, increase. The, the city is actually planning to go all the way out to George Street. So there's going to have to be some coordination between um, our development and when the city is doing that work. So I think for purposes of, of an approval, uh, what that means is we'll cooperate with the uh, water department with regard to timing and the construction work done rather than to tie up church street two different times. <clears throat> but we are res we will be responsible for whatever cost associated with it in our frontage. And I would also ask uh, for for the record just the other the other waivers that I've indicated. I'm assuming that uh, you can confirm that those waivers are being requested. Yes. Um Section 8.8 of the um, engineering standards requires a driveway width of 30 feet minimum, um, which, which we would qualify for the minimum under that standard. Um, and we're asking for 24 feet. Again, this is a, a, a driveway dimension that would normally be applicable to a physical driveway that's being constructed within a um, <coughs> site, whereas our driveway is really the resulting curb cut from the access to our parking garage. So the for parking garage opening is 24 feet, and we're matching that with our portable driveway, which is really an eight room. Uh, so we're requesting relief from that. Uh, there's no impact to um, any of the public, public welfare, um, and, and the additional width wouldn't really serve a purpose since the access to the parking deck is only 24 feet wide as well. Um, we'll probably end up widening that a little bit with our, some of the ramps. It might be a little bit uh, larger than 24 feet, but uh, 24 feet is what we would request the um, the waiver for it. Um, and then there's relief for parking stall width. Um, eight and a half feet is the minimum stall width that's proposed within the parking deck. That's very typical for uh, to have instances where you have parking stalls that are as small as eight and a half feet within a parking deck, especially in this type of, of uh, transit community. Um, usually vehicles are smaller vehicles uh, for tenants that are parking in the parking deck. Um, and the same for the 22 foot aisle. Um, there's a 22 foot aisle, sorry, there's a 24 foot aisle requirement for the width of a parking lot aisle on 90 degree stalls, and we're proposing a 22 foot dimension. Um, that combined with the full 18 foot length sum is certainly sufficient for maneuvering for parking, uh, for parking within the parking deck. I have no further questions to Mr. Doherty. Any board members have questions for the witness? Bob? I'm uh, not sure you're the proper professional to address this, but is the entire, I'm assuming the entire building is sprinkler? Yes. So yes, it is. Oh, that, okay. Yes. Uh, I don't know if this is part of your analysis or not, but I mean, do you, does the city have the uh, capability of uh, the support services to support this, this kind of uh, facility? Now, what kind of support? I'm thinking in particular fire. Fire? That's the fire guy. Sit next to you. Fire guy. <laughs> Sorry, Chris. Yeah. Um, oh, I mean, there's obviously uh, um, the one thing about this building is a Type One building. It's fully sprinkler. Uh, it's meant to be compartmentalized as compared to uh, fire spread from one apartment to another apartment. To another. It's meant to be compartmentalized. It is sprinkler in all common areas as well as in between. So. Um, the fire suppression that's added it does aid to this type of construction. So, uh, not that that necessarily means that the sprinkler is going to put out a fire as opposed to contain the fire, uh, but it will help. Sorry. <laughs> Board of professionals, uh, have all your questions or comments been satisfied? If not, could you let us know? Comments have been satisfied. Comments satisfied. Thank you. I think you're off the hook for now, but we always reserve the right to uh, 
bring you back. I'm not going to run away. All right. Uh, at this time, I would call Mr. Matthew Seckler for testimony. Can you, uh, can you please state your name to our last name for the record? Matthew Seckler, that's S E C K L E R. Do you swear or not tell the whole truth nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. And then you are a licensed professional engineer in the state of New Jersey, is that correct? That's correct. And I think in that capacity, uh, in uh, your expertise in general, in traffic and parking considerations? Correct. Uh, also, in that capacity, you submitted a uh, traffic and parking assessment report to the board in furtherance of the application. Yes, I did. Uh, could you give the board the benefit of your professional qualifications and experience? Sure. Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering from Union College, a Master's of City Regional Planner from Rutgers University, licensed engineer and planner in the state, and recognized professional traffic operations engineer by the Institute of Transportation Engineers. Been accepted for this board and over 100 other boards in the state. We will accept you as an expert. Thank you. Uh, if you could, Matt, uh, uh, take some time to give us the parking and traffic analysis that you've done. Um, and again, it's some, somewhat of a usual situation because the, gar the, the main garage is already there and you've got a garage that we're replacing so in effect all well, the parking is essentially there already but having said that I think it's helpful for the members of the public to have an understanding of that parking consideration and also the traffic analysis. Absolutely and as one of the first things that we perform because this is the unique case where we're replacing an existing parking garage what we did is we did parking counts for four days in October, basically from morning through the end of the night, weekday and weekend, to get an understanding of the parking demand in the current garage, as well as the Spring Street garage. So we have an understanding of who's parking the garage today, and will our development, when we increase that amount of parking, is there sufficient spaces in those garages? So as I stated, we counted within those garages, nine to five, uh, nine in the morning to five in the afternoon on, on the weekdays, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. on the weekends to get a full understanding of what's going on in these garages. What we found was that the total amount of cars parked at maximum at any one time was 254 cars total between the two garages. So that's between the Spring Street and the existing garage that's going to be taken down. So we knew that we had to t leave at least 254 parking spaces left over for those users in the future at the end of this development. Then we had to determine how much parking is needed for this development. And as part of this redevelopment plan, uh, there is a parking standard that we need to satisfy. That includes and is based on the original RSIS numbers that the city has, but also takes into account that this location, because it's within one eighth of a mile of the train station, shouldn't need or shouldn't require the same amount of parking as other developments uh, elsewhere, either within the city or elsewhere throughout New Jersey. Um, and again, this being a location, again, with an eighth of a mile of the train station in the city where there's going to be and continues to be more and more intra-city trips, people that are going to the college, going to the, working at the hospitals, working at other corporate offices in the area, may not need the same level of parking as you know, if we we're going to build this development in Warren County somewhere. So the total requirement for parking for this development, when you take into account the proximity to the, the train station that we have here, EV parking credits the state allows and requires, as well as the standard for parking for affordable housing, is 51 parking spaces required for this piece of development. So we took the 254 spaces that cars have been counted in the lot today, or in October, and the 51 spaces that this development requires to have, and it totals 305 parking spaces that are needed between the two garages. We actually have 499 parking spaces, so clearly sufficient parking uh, for the existing cars that use the two garages and the uh, potential residents of this building. As was mentioned, uh, access to the garage will be key fob or regulated, so it's not basically open to the public. People would rent spaces on a month-to-month -month basis uh, within the garage themselves. So everyone who parks there now will still have a parking space. Um, and anyone who's moving into this building will also have a parking space. I know there was some discussion about traffic, trip generation. Um, while I get into the numbers of how much traffic is generated from a site like this, I think what we see now in urban environments, especially ones that have rich transit, most of the congestion we see is not from the developments within the downtowns or in these urban areas. It's from the friction on the streets. It's from the double parking. 
It's from the delivery vehicles, the garbage vehicles, the Uber drop-off pickup. That is creating a lot of the friction on the road. Um, whereas a development like this, one that only needs 51 parking spaces, is not obviously, you know, significantly increasing the amount of traffic on the road. So you heard the testimony earlier, and I'm just going to emphasize the fact that all that friction activity, drop off and pick up for people within the building, we basically created a little curb cut, little bump out, so that people could park, uh, Ubers, DoorDash, those people could park on uh, along Spring Street and not block Spring Street. They'll have their own basically little pull off area. We heard the discussion about the move in, move out, the garbage. Again, when those activities take place on the street, it generates a lot more of that friction. We're able to move that off the street, within the building or lot itself, again, reducing the amount of friction. So when we look at the amount of traffic we're generating, which again is you know, uh, pretty insignificant when you look at the fact that we only have 51 parking spaces, and we're helping take all those kind of other trips, or those other friction factors, and taking them off the street, having the curb cut, uh, the, the bump outs, having the internal parking, it does allow us to state that this development will not negatively impact the traffic in this general area. So again, from a parking perspective, we meet the parking requirements with this development. In fact, we have more than sufficient parking for, uh, per the parking requirements, and the traffic we're generating is insignificant, and those, I'd say, special trips that really create a lot more of the friction than 51 cars that may be coming in and out of the garage, that's being handled through the, uh, the site development that you've heard from the previous witnesses. Again, the, we, these facilities are essentially there already, and they're actively being used. Yes. So that gives us some sense of the traffic that's being generated now? Yes. Okay. Uh, I want you to go back and just so we can understand a little better. You did an analysis of the Spring Street Garage to determine the, at the peak hours, how many parking spaces are actually being utilized, is that correct? That is correct. And what was that number? So, the, the maximum in Spring Street um, was 168, and then again, we also counted the existing garage we're taking down, so we basically had to add those two values together. The total maximum between the two garages was 254. And that's at a peak, that's the most that your, your analysis showed? That's the, that's the worst case on the worst days that we counted in October. So that left a surplus currently of 245 spaces? Correct. And we're adding the city's requirement under the plan is 51 additional spaces? Correct. Okay. We meet, so we meet that requirement. We still have a significant surplus in the garage after that, is that true? That is correct. Mr. Seth, yes. I have a question. Yes. So we did this traffic study, I'm not going to harp on this, I just want to make sure I better understand it. So yes. it's 9 to 5 p.m., 8 to 8 p.m. on four days in October, best to understand peak hour traffic. That was the best to understand actually the how much parking spaces were used in the garage, the peak garage use. Okay. Yeah. My, my only question about this, please educate me, is that one Spring Street is residential. So 9 to 5 is presumably empty, right? It's after 5 when people get home and they fill up that garage. Is that, is that not the case? No. So the whole time? Spring Street actually sees... <laughs> Spring Street sees its peak actually at 11 a.m. was really? when we found it to have its peak on a weekday. Okay. On the weekend, its peak happened to be at 9 a.m. Obviously, people that may have not moved their car, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. slept there and then, you know, maybe leave it throughout the day. So here's my concern. It's my only concern. Okay. So once it's residential and everybody's home for the night and all the cars are in there, and then we have this additional commercial that's at the bottom of that. Then what happens to the parkability and traffic and all of that? There's an additional draw now because there's the commercial. There's something to do there. Yeah, so again, I think the benefit or the, the, the delta between what were required and what we could fit in the garage is significant. So again, even if there is you know, a, a time of day or more people are using the garage than when we did the counts or you know, a different use here, the commercial use here, we still have between the requirement and what we're building, 194 unaccounted parking spaces. So if for some reason this is a significant draw, the draw changes, we've had that, we have that delta of a lot of extra parking spaces. Fob, the fob entry, so it's just for people. Who just for people living, living, correct. Or have a permit. Or have a permit. Yeah, like an employee of that may decide to get a permit. I am, I'm sure something you know could be worked out for employees that they would be able to purchase the monthly pass or the tenant.
Uh, is, there an, is there an assumption that a certain percentage of the folks in this building are not going to have vehicles, that they're going to be commuters? So I would say yes, and your ordinance and the redevelopment plan contemplates that. Again, the redevelopment plan for this area has taken into account that this is near the train, you have the bike parking on site, you have a lot of uses being built in this area that, again, I think the whole concept of this hub is to re decrease the reliance of people needing to own cars. That's the hub, so. Yeah. But again, and I state we're not meeting that parking demand and saying, listen, if there's two more people on cars than what the ordinance thought, we're out of luck. We've got hundreds of spaces beyond that. And I think you're right, the dynamic from a city perspective is that we want to create a more walkable city. And we have all of those key factors in New Brunswick at this point, and we're only building more to strengthen that. So I understand where you get the figures from. I think there's a certain amount of expectation as well in the, the thought, not to speak for the planner, but that many of the people that are going to live here will be working right across the street. I mean, that's the major draw of the helix, and by the time that project is done, it's going to change the whole dynamic of that location. And that's part of the, a big part of the reason why the train station is being upgraded and expanded for that reason. And having Amtrak having six stops a day, I mean, there's going to be people that are coming in here from out of town, working, leaving. And I think, obviously, this building is providing a, a place to live as well if you're in that mode and you're working right there. So. At least the whole thought process, I think, of the redevelopment. Uh, since you started questioning, I have no further questions. <laughs> Four persons have no questions. Four professionals. I have a quick question. Will you have a problem during construction when you knock down the, the, stru the, the structure? So we do still have enough within the other garage, plus, I believe the operators would obviously have to manage that, you know, make sure that people that currently have spaces have to get reassigned, keep off, things like that, to the other location. You will have enough spaces in the other parking garage? Yeah. Yes. Definitely, sir. Yes. Thank you. That's it. Any further questions? That completes our presentation. Uh, the only thing that I neglected to do, I just want to introduce, you know, Sam Borai who's representative here of Fluoride Development. I know that um, there are questions from the public that, may, that he may want to address, so I just want to make sure I'm not hiding them. <laughs> should we preemptively spur him in? I think we should. Can you uh, please state your name, spell your last name for the record? Sam Borai, B-O-R-A-I-E. Do you swear from tell the whole truth enough about the truth? I do. Thank you. So that uh, completes our Thank you, Mr. Kelso. Perfect, sir. So can you state your name? Yes, my name is Alan Dunst. Spell your last name for the record. D-U-N-S-T. Do you swear or tell the whole truth and nothing about the truth? I do. Give me a minute. Just one moment, sir. Sure. Give me a minute. Full time. I live at the... Uh, is it okay, Mr. Chairman? No, not yet. Sorry. Just one second. I'll, 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 I'll give you a... It is past my bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Please proceed. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. As I said, my name is Alan Dunst. I live uh, at 1 Spring Street. Uh, I've been there since the building was built. Uh, I know Mr. Borai. I know his brother. And I know his dad, who I've known for 100 years or so. <laughs> uh, Many of my neighbors are here today because they have some concerns about other people using the garage at Spring Street from a security point of view. And I think that's one of the major issues that, that I think people had. <clears throat> I've spoken with Mr. Borai, I've spoken with his brother, uh, and out in the hall before we started tonight, uh, I think I was assured by them that they would put 
gates on the doors of Spring Street Garage, which, which are not there now. Uh, and we have other people from our apartment building that have spoken with Sam many times before, and I think that's the major concern. I also have a little concern, which is irrelevant, but from my 23rd floor apartment, this is going to block a little bit of my view, but that's my problem. <laughs> uh, but I think, I think that's, that's the issue, Sam, if you could perhaps address that. And they, they may have other issues, sure. but that's the one that I understood was one of the major ones. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And, and if I just make me say for the record, we, we think it's important that we respond to that. We think the residents of One Spring Street need to know that. It's not particularly relevant to the application, but we're all here together, and I think it's helpful for us to, to be able to respond to that and, and answer their concerns. And I agree with Mr. Kelso that it, it may not be relevant, but it's just an issue that they tried have. our first cases against each other 40 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> That's a true story. And he, was, he was bragging about who won. <laughs> I, I say he won, and he says I won. <laughs> there you go. It's a true story. Could you speak? Sure. Um, so we, we've all been living this for the last several years. Since COVID, um, the way these garages have operated has changed a lot. Uh, open structures have been, um, you know, inundated with, with people looking for spaces. And that's just the world we live in today. It's happening everywhere. I know it happens in other park garages in New Brunswick. Um, so for the last couple of years, we've been working together to try to figure out the best way to uh, control some of the issues. So it's been a combination of having, uh, working with New Brunswick Police Department, uh, having them come through the garage, and that helped to a certain extent at the beginning. Um, we added some, uh, some overnight security and some other things, but these things really haven't worked very well. So one of the things we've been talking about is, is sitting down as a group, um, probably with the board, maybe that's the best idea, not quite sure, but just kind of going over, you know, um, a plan to show where we plan to put gates, how we plan to control access, and, you know, I personally think that one of uh, the best things to improve security in a structure is actually having more activity in it. So, you know, right now the structure is primarily empty at night. You know, there's probably 120 to 150 parking spaces at max. And you know, once that garage is more crowded, not overcrowded, but more crowded, I think it helps, it helps to have that kind of activity. And I think uh, you know, adding the gates, it's not foolproof, but you know, additional cameras and that sort of thing uh, goes a long way. I mean, there are other things within your building that you've decided to address, you know, the front doors, the garage elevator, you know, all those things have to be done done together and in concert, and I think, you know, we can alleviate some of the concerns. Um, our plan is to actually start working on that sooner, before this even starts. Um, it's a much better environment today to, to do that kind of work, and Barry and I have spoken about that, so that's, that's what we commit to doing, and, um, you know, I hope that's satisfactory to you. Thanks. Thanks. Mr. Boy, real quick, is there, is there a plan for a gate? We got a round of applause. <laughs> I don't want to take that away. From you. Is there a plan to gate the three Spring Street? I'm sorry. Will there be a gate at the three Spring Street property? Or is it the new property? There will be. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. So the thank you. Tower three. Sorry. I'm, Tower three. That's Tower, right. Oh, I, I, it's a lot of springs in there. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Tower three. All right. Who would like to go next? Please state your name and spell your last name for the record. Anne Clower, K L A U, B as a boy, E R. Do you swear from tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. You may begin. Hi, I also live at One Spring. Um, and I have two questions. One, and I apologize, I did come in a little late, um, so I might have missed it. Um, we were talking about the parking, and it should be excessive, it shouldn't be any shortage anywhere. But I'm concerned we didn't talk about, I think I read somewhere there's going to be retail space in here. That's going to bring traffic. So I'm not understanding how you think it's not going to create more double parking, people delivering, picking up, things of that nature, right? Because yes, you're putting it off to the side, but there's only so much room. So that's number one. And number two, 
especially when the parking will be taken down and then the overflow coming over to one spring. One of the reasons why I moved into this building, I've been here two years, I purchased an electric vehicle because this is one of the buildings that has EV charging in it. They recently did away with the free charging and now you put up four, I think, pay for charging that are very slow, by the way, <laughs> unbelievably <laughs> slow. Um, so now I don't even use it. But my concern is if the overflow for those four charges is going to be enough. So I understand that you put in four. I think we had two or three before. So definitely you're looking at getting more. But I wasn't aware that this parking would be taken down. People coming over, that's, you know, there's only a very small, there's four spaces for EV parking. I and I can five. tell you probably, I'm sorry, five. Well, there's four spots, four charges, five parking spots, mm -hmm. but there's four charges. It's not, the old ones had two charges each. You don't have that anymore. So that's number one. Um, so I'm just, I'm very concerned about that. So you just have a very small area. And I believe, I don't know if anybody, I'm trying to look here. Um, we have at least, I'm going to guess, five to ten electric vehicles in our building now. More. More. More, that's what I'm saying. I, I, I always see typically the same ones. Yes. Um, but so, 10 minimum. Sure. So yes, if we can just talk about that, that would be fantastic. But again, yeah. retail space, I'd like to know how that's not going to create. Again, I understand what you said before, Madam Chairman, that you know, we want to walk around. It's one of the reasons why I moved here from suburbia, right? I love the fact that I can walk everywhere, extra shops or whatever, but we're limited that's, that area right there is horrendous yeah. with the amount of deliveries and double parking as it is. I mean, we always, we wanted to put retail, we thought it was very important to put retail in the ground floor to just activate the sidewalks, activate the street. Um, it's a small space, who knows what it'll be, whether it'll be at a restaurant or, or something like that or a service, it's hard to, hard to guess, but uh, you know, it is a downtown, so you know we think it's a good addition, and we thought it was a good spot for it. We could have used it for for service and other things, but uh, we just think it fits there. As far as the parking is concerned, um, we basically right. I think right now there are five uh, chargers. You're saying four, but I think there's five there, and um, we basically put them into the building based on demand and how many cars there are. I mean, right now there's we were just talking about there's not a lot of cars in the garage. But over time, as more cars are in the garage, we would have to put more in. Right. Um, you, know, you mentioned that you're paying for it now. Um, I think we were the only garage that was offering free parking or free charging for a right. long time. No, and but, I, and I, I have no yeah. problem with it. I'm one of the people that actually suggested, but for a supercharger, not something that takes eight hours to charge. And then if you don't get up in time, you're going to charge $10 an hour because I didn't get downstairs too quickly. That's good to know. I did not know. Yeah, not okay. too happy about that. So like I'm saying, it takes literally overnight for that thing to charge. And then if it's, if it's left idling, because it'll tell, you know, it'll say idling, you know, but if it's 6 a.m. and I'm sleeping, I'm going to get charged $10 an hour before I rush downstairs. That guy sitting right back there is the one who put them in. We're going to talk to him after this <laughs> I'll find you afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Kelso, does your traffic engineer have anything to add about the retail concern or just? I just very briefly state the new garage in the building will have 18 EV parking spaces. So obviously that is being pre-wired, pre-set up for the higher demand that we're already seeing. And then again, the a retail space is less than 1,800 square feet. So again, this is not intended to be people coming from all over to this place, it's intended to be the neighborhood retail servicing office users in the area, residential users in the area. To, to add a little perspective, eight, uh, 1,800 square feet in this room is probably that side of the columns. So you're talking about a really small kind of retail area, cafe it's still or something. Bring traffic. Well, you know, it'll, right? Because you can't say that we want it to be an area where people come to, but then say, yeah, it's really only meant for it's, the It's metal, metal to support this one too. It's it's really because especially because of its location and its size, it's going to be serving the people that are upstairs and around the corner coming by for a coffee, a newspaper, whatever that may be. It's not going to be a draw. It's you know, we're not talking about a, a customer draw. Okay, it's just contradictory, but okay. Would you like to go next? 
Can you state your name and spell your last name for the record, please? Sure. Rui Gaji, R-O-O-H-I, G-A-J-E-E. -E. Do you swear from tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. I have an extensive list of questions, so I'm requesting the report to humor me a little bit, please. Uh, thank you, Sam, for the presentation. Uh, will there be parking, paid parking for public available like it is now uh, in the new building because you do have the things after 5 p.m.? So currently the Albany Street garage that's coming down, we do put public parking in there after 5. Um, we have not um, gotten into that yet. We haven't decided how the garage is going to operate, but there would still be, right now the guest parking system at Spring Street would still be accommodated. Um, with the overflow into the Spring Street garage, uh, will there be parking spot assignments for Spring Street residents? Is, this is for the arch <coughs> architect, please, I think. Is it possible to offset the entrance exit for the new garage so it doesn't directly face the entrance exit to the uh, Spring Street? Because that's already causing a problem for yeah, us. I don't think it's directly across from the uh, the other garage entrance. It is on the, they face each other relatively in that block. They're both on the same street. But I don't think they're directly opposite. One. Right now, Mike, they are. Right now, they're directly right. across. Right. The new plan it's has them there. offset. It, it, okay. They are. Because there's we already issues right now where people just fly out of the garage and they're like, oops. Okay. Um, Next question, how will the parking space's availability um, in the Spring Street garage be monitored? And what happens if there aren't enough spaces? I know you guys didn't mention that, but I do have another follow-up question. So again, you need to have a fob or entrance, you know, ability to get in the garage. So obviously they will not give out more fobs than there are spaces. So, you know, if there are, you know, mm -hmm. 300 fobs and 400 spaces, then you know you'll have enough spaces in the garage. And I think Sam, I uh, think you, we all talked about this a little bit, but there are many different people who use the parking in the Spring Street garage. We have the office folks in the Spring Street building, we have the Spring Street residents, and there are some other place, people like the board room, uh, the root people who park in the parking garage. Um, how are we gonna maintain the security in, in that? Because we know there's an issue, so I know we sort of talked about this, but can you clarify a little bit, please? Yeah, so I think um, adding, adding gates, uh, card access to the doors to access, so the same card that you use to access the garage gate would use the doors on the sides of the building. Um, and as far as people, it, all the different uses, sure, I mean, there's still going to be people from the Albany Street parking garage or the Spring Street, I'm sorry, the Albany Street office building or the Spring Street office building that will still park in the garage the same way it operates today. So you're going to put a door where the uh, parking garage is facing Church Street? Because there There'll is a be spot. roll up gates. No, okay. there, there's a spot there that is open to the public. It's out on the street. On the right, by the elevator. Yes. By the elevator. Correct. Yeah. So that would be closed off. There right. Be there, that, yeah. key fob? that will be a key fob entrance to get into the garage, correct? And then how will the alleyway be maintained and monitored in the new building? As we know, we have a homeless problem. <laughs> alleyway. Uh, I thought there was an alleyway. It's an existing, that? that's an existing alleyway. So okay. the same way it is right now. We have a gate on the Church Street side. At night, it's, it's locked, maintained. We have cameras. Okay. Um, residents of the new building who park in the Spring Street garage, will they have to exit the garage to go into their building? Or are you doing a walkway or somehow? No, they no, have to get out. The street. Okay. Right. One minute. One minute remaining. Oh, one minute. Oh, my gosh. Um, okay, will parking meters be available on Church Street like they are now? He said yes. Yes. Yes, yes. okay. Um, so the, number, the information regarding the number of parking spots counted in October, um, were, they, there were, were, they, were they based on the commercial space being totally occupied? Like, I thought there were some people. Some the commercial space was complete. So Spring Street was 100% occupied, as was Albany Street was 95% occupied, or 90, something like that. Um, will the residents of the new building have access to both the garages and vice versa? That hasn't been determined yet how, that, okay. how that's going to work. OK, um, I think that's it. Thank you.
back there because it's come out. If you could say your name and spell your last name for the record. Shagna Mansari, last name Mansari, A N S A R I. You swear from the whole thing, nothing but the truth. You may begin. Thank you. So I have a question about your um, parking garage study. It was conducted last year, October. We were still in COVID time. And the garage, I can see right from my window, it was mostly empty last year. If you compare it to now, it is much more full. So that number doesn't align with what we have right now. And same goes for the street seat parking as well. Last October, I could get in and I could find a parking spot on foot level in my building. Now I get it, I have to go all the way to either fifth or sixth. So the number doesn't make sense. Definitely doesn't make sense. The time has changed. Most of the places are opening up, offices are opening up. Even on Albany Street office building, many more people are coming up. It's full to the terrace most of the time. Last October, you couldn't even see many people on the second floor. So that study should be conducted again. So we have a uh, system that tracks how many cars are in the garage at any given time. And it's funny that you mentioned the peak you had, or the max was 168, I think. Um, earlier today, we did a reading at, I think it was uh, 2.30 or, or 3 p.m., which is also a peak time, and there were 166 cars in the garage. So it's very similar to where it was. And I, I implore you to, to walk through and, and count the cars yourself. You're in the garage. Yeah. The study was done in October, you didn't say it was done today. So definitely, I definitely your point was it was October, it was not today, and I can guarantee it's more than 160. I'm ready to work with you because I am the one who cannot find a parking. Yes. I have two surgeries on my legs. I am not qualified for disabled parking. I have to park all the way in the back and walk to the elevator. It is not a great experience. So your numbers don't match, definitely. October study, it should be done again. Many places have opened up. I can witness you. The Albany Street parking garage is much more full. Definitely. So before coming over here, so earlier today, the, the one of the max times, like I said, was around 164 or something. I don't remember the exact number. Before coming over here, it was down to about 120. So I think by the time you go home, if you look, it's probably in that 140 range. Max. I'm going to go do it myself too. I will. I will. I think you should come. <laughs> Once again, that's the only request. Um, you, you know, because you said it's October and I, I think it is not, the, the timing is not fine. The other part of that is our Albany Street garage mm -hmm. right now, less than 20 cars. <laughs> there, there's probably, there's five of us in there, but once we leave... Right now, so. it might be yes, because That's it is uh, guest party. Daytime, it is more than 20. Definitely more than 20, because I can count from my window. <laughs> so I'm telling you with experience. So that's something that does concern me. Like, uh, I was looking at the traffic study and how many parking spots you are assigning. You guys have a lot many units in the new building, and you are assigning like 0.8 or... 0.5, something like that per unit, and you have a lot of studios. All that is fine if you align with the, the city requirement, but it is still going to put a lot of burden on all of us in terms of parking. So that should be considered. And second point that I would like to discuss is the traffic. Even now on Church Street, it's a nightmare. You come there, people are parallel parked. There's existing parking. People park parallel. The garbage truck comes, you are stuck there for half an hour. I myself was stuck there. I don't know, you mentioned, and person asked as well, will the truck in the new building is going to go inside the building to pick it up? Or is it going to pick up on the street? If it is going all the way in the building, okay, is the, maybe it will help. But if it is going to be on the street, we have a big problem today as well, on Church Street. It is a nightmare. On the day of the pickup, Recycling and garbage, that's a problem. And also you said you don't think the traffic is going to increase on Church Street because you are not providing parking, most of the people will not have cars, but you have to realize there are a lot of Uber rides. And also there are a lot of Uber or DoorDash deliveries that come. 
That's a problem at one Spring Street as well. Many times people just park, when they are delivering the food, they just go, if they don't find like a peak hours at between 6 and 8, they just park, drop it off quickly and come. But then I'm standing on Spring Street to make a left, I cannot do that. That's a problem today as well. So Uber, DoorDash, everything is going to be a problem. And where, how are they going to get to the right side? Oh, sorry, just one last question if you allow me. <laughs> how are you going to get to the front of that building? You will be coming on church. Church will be crowded a lot. So it is going to be a problem. It is going to add to a problem that we have today. I will let others today is the concern, but these are my concerns. Thank you. State your name and spell your last name for the record. Ellen Freedy, F R E D E. Do you swear or mark tell the whole truth about the truth? I do. Yeah. I just said, uh, I'm, thank you for the presentation. You've answered most of my concerns. I just have a couple of remaining ones. Um, and by the way, I think it's a beautiful building, and I'm so happy my condo faces the other direction. <laughs> <laughs> The, uh, but I had to do with deal with the premier, so you know. Um, the, the, um, I'm, I just don't get your calculations. When uh, maybe I misheard the the traffic report, uh, but the, the study on the parking lot. But I thought you said 51 spaces are going to be generated by the new building. That's the city ordinance requirement for this development: 51 spaces. For that many. Apartments? Yes. I could go through the calculation, but again, this is the city requirement. Basically, there is no requirement for any of the affordable housing. So those units, there's no requirement. Because of our proximity to the train station, the standard statewide calculation is cut in half. So whereas we'd be required to have 1.3 parking space for every two bedroom, instead it's half that. And we get a credit for the EV parking spaces that are required. That's a state requirement. And then there is a shared parking credit between when you have residential and office, there's an understanding that sometimes residential users may be using a space and then office users may be using it during the other time of day. So, so that's not anything like what is what the parking authority finds in their buildings, which is 0.8 per unit. So this is way below 0.8 per unit. So again, it's the ordinance requirement based on the redevelopment plan. Again, I, I understand it's, it's, that you're following the yeah, law. Yeah. I'm saying, what is this going to actually yeah. mean for us who want to find parking spaces? And again, <laughs> I, I would say the benefit to this is that we didn't we didn't hit the number. We didn't say 51 plus what's out there. Let's build that number. We have additional parking. So if you know people do have more than 51 parking park cars for this building, we still have over 100 and 90 other spaces. And, and I, I also, I had no idea that you were talking about October 2022 20, when you did the study. Sam, it sounds like you could do it right now and go back and look at your records and redo the study. If, 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 if the FOBs can, can let you, you know, you said you could, you look, you can just look and see. It would not be that hard to redo it. And what I was saying was the numbers are basically the same as they were at this point last year. That's not the same as an I'm sorry, it's not. I would like to see an official study redone so that we can so that we can really understand because um, the the master deed allowed for us to have um, the 315 of the existing bar parking spaces were um, reserved for residents and commercial, with 110 of those reserved for Albany Street. Um, that that left us considerably more than they're saying we currently use. And I just want to make sure we always have that as a, as a potential, that we're not going to, um, and, and I would like to see what the actual study is. Because I agree, I don't, I, I think things are much, that it's much more parked up than it used to be. Uh, well, you can prove it to me by doing another study, Sam. <laughs> I mean, I would just say that the last thing we would want is to, I mean, we have the, the most vested interest in not having a parking issue. The last thing I want is residents complaining about parking, office tenants complaining about parking. So we design the size of the building, the scope of it, taking into account 
how much available parking we believe we have. And I can tell you, we, we spent time on the parking study, we were in the garage, um, and we've been tracking it since that time. And the numbers are what they are. And again, I, I could somewhat opine on where I think is happening with the parking, is that as someone mentioned, more people are coming to the office, driving, going to the office. So I think it's what happen, what's happening is that the office number is going up, but similarly the resident number during the day is going down because some of those people are now driving to an office place. And so the number is probably still around the same at the max, but the ratios may be slightly different. It may be a little bit higher residential during one time, lower office. And I'm just more so, concerned yeah. about how many are coming over from the other building. And I, I, you don't actually have to convince me, Sam, because I don't have any power here. You have to convince <laughs> that. <laughs> and, and, but I want to bring it up as an issue. And the other thing I wanted to bring up is there are going to be more and more electrical vehicles, and obviously more and more of the spaces in our building should accommodate that, which are then spaces that can't be used for regular parking. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Louise Foreman, F O R M A N. I'm a resident at Spring Street. Oh, hold on, just where you go. Do you swear or tell the truth? I do. You may begin. Resident of Spring, Spring Street now for 10 years. And thank you for all the information tonight. I have a couple of comments and a couple of questions. I don't really understand the sidewalk plans right now. It's terrible, and it basically there's no sidewalk to speak of on the Spring Street side that this building will be on. Um, it's very narrow, and then there's the garbage cans that apparently will go away. So I'd like a better explanation of that. The um, idea that you don't need a car might work for some people, but we're very happy when we have days that we don't use our car. We love that. But when we want to go food shopping or anything else, there's just not that much that you have here in New Brunswick. So we use a car to do our major shopping, and I think these people will also. So I think you might be surprised at how many people are going to want to have a car. So that's a couple of things. The existing, so the area that you see outlined in the street right now, the white line, that is all going to be sidewalk. Going back to the, the striped area, that's going to be the new sidewalk. It is going to go back further than where the existing parking garage is. It's about 10 feet further than that. So it's going to be a very wide sidewalk compared to what you have out there right now. Overhead lighting. Yes, because that's actually the property line. That white line you see out there right now is the property line. Okay. This portion is a covered arcade. So this is a series of columns, and then so you can walk under there, and the sidewalk on the end plan. At the narrowest, it's 14. When you get out to this point, it's probably closer to 20 feet. And is this that bump in that yes. you were talking about? Yeah, but at the bump in, it's still 14 feet wide. <laughs> they pull, we pulled the lobby way back to, to address that narrow okay. sidewalk. Okay. Um, there's a lot of apartments in a small lot, and I'm wondering what's the typical square footage of, let's say, the one bedroom, because that's the majority of the apartments. How small they, are they these vary, things? They're, they're normal size for these apartments. They vary from 700 to 800 square feet for a one bedroom. They're small, smaller, smaller than condominiums would it's typically small. be, but, but for <laughs> rental apartments, they're normal size. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And how are you going to decide who parks where? If I was renting in this building, I would not want to have to cross the street in the rain and the snow to get to and from my car with or without groceries. So how are you going to decide who gets the privilege of parking in that building versus our building? Hasn't been determined yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, I think that's about it. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Yes? State your name and spell your last name for the record. Hi, my name is Ray Pettit. I spell P's and P's and E-T-I-T. I live at One Spring Street. 
swear or affirm to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. You may begin. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. It did address most of my concerns. One that I do have has to do with, I think one of the variants that you're seeking has to do with the size of the spots in the parking garage. And if that's going to be different from the size of one Spring Street, my concern is that it might create like a two-tier system, kind of like what Louise was saying, that our spots are going to be better than their spots. And my, also, my concern also has to do with the handicapped spots. Will that, will, are you also seeking the variance for the handicapped spots? So I'll answer. The uh, Spring Street actually has some of the same waivers. So the eight and a half uh, foot wide stalls, as well as I think there's some drive aisles there that are 22 feet. So the garage is pretty similar. Um, you know, the circulation may be different. Uh, it's a different design. But um, those waivers are similar to ones we've requested there, as well as uh, at the Aspire. And so our spots are not going to be larger <clears throat> than the new spots? Um, I, I can't really say that for certain. I think there, there's a mix. There may be some compact spots in the new garage. Uh, if, there's, if there's not enough uh, length, instead of an 18 foot, it might be 16 foot, but they would all be labeled. Um, but kind of similar to what you have at Spring Street. Yeah. And as far as handicap, there would be handicap per, per code requirements. No, 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 no deviation in the handicap spaces. OK. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. Come on up. State your name and tell your last name for the record. Alan Cander, C A N D E R. Do you swear or affirm to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, yeah. begin. Uh, thank you. I appreciate it. I am troubled by this notion that seems to be implicit in the study that people who live in affordable housing units will not need cars. I'm also concerned because I'm a professor at Rutgers, and I'm pretty sure that looking at these types of units, that you're going to have a lot of students, maybe medical students and Rutgers students, and they are not going to be just one student in each unit. You're going to have people doubling up, sometimes perhaps even tripling up. To think that they will not need cars does not make any sense. By the way, I'm also a professor of urban planning at the Blaustein School of Planning and Public Policy. So I do know what I'm talking about. If we lived in a linear urban area where everybody worked and lived and commuted along a rail line or a linear bus line, then this would all make a lot of sense. But people live in one suburb, maybe New Brunswick, maybe Piscataway, and they work in another suburb. They are not going to use a train or a bus or anything that is mass transit to get to those places. This does not make sense to me, OK? I understand that you're using these credit numbers and you're following the ordinance. But I agree with Ellen. It does not answer the question, how are all of these? What are you going to do if some of these people in one of these units in that new building have two cars? We have people in our building who have four cars because they're permitted to do so. Mm -hmm. So I don't understand how you could come up with these numbers and think that this is going to be sufficient and that we're not going to have problems and that we're not going to be, have to be fighting <coughs> over spaces. And frankly, the idea that you know, you're going to make a little jog come out of our parking deck because you can't find a parking space in our deck and then make a little jog and sort of go across the street, Church Street, into this new space, that is insane. It's going to create traffic problems. It's going to create safety problems. And I think you need to redo the study and rethink everything that you're doing about this. I'm sorry, but that's how I feel. So, thank you. Thank you. Yes, you could address that. Yes. Again, we are building 499 parking spaces where 305 are required by ordinance. That leaves 194 parking spaces where if people have to own two cars, if an affordable unit resident has a car, which again, we're not saying they won't own cars, we're just saying the ordinance allows that. Even if we took zero credits for this development, we went back to the New Jersey RSIS numbers, the statewide number, if we were building a high-rise building in Warren County, and we took those values for what would be uh, 
built here, we would still have 79 parking spaces. Warren County does not have our density. Warren County does right. not have so, our, yeah. no, our anything. No, no. The state, New Jersey, DCA, establishes the New Jersey RSIS, Resident Site Improvement Standards, for all residential development within New Jersey. If you build a high-rise development anywhere in New Jersey, the parking requirements would be the 0.8 for a one-bedroom and 1 1.3 for a two-bedroom. If we took those numbers, didn't take a credit for affordable housing, didn't take a credit for being within an eighth of a mile of train station, didn't take an EV parking credit for this building, we'd still have 79 parking spaces left over. Perfect. Is there, so, ask yeah. is there a scenario in which the number of files per unit can just be limited to ensure that you don't have a situation where there's triple, yes. you're tripling up and you have 12 this cars that, that, that have affordable tenants and they have more cars than I've ever seen? So that's exactly correct. The parking is available for lease to renters. Doesn't mean that anybody that comes in just gets whatever they need, one, two, or three cars. They have to rent from us. And if we don't, the last thing we want to see is an overcrowded parking garage. So we basically only allow a car per apartment max. And most people don't take it. With all due respect, I understand that you teach it, but it's just not reality. It just is not reality. I right now, your credit system that you're using and your studies for Warren County are necessarily reality either. This is not Warren County, and we're not talking but about Warren County. But, but you're actually sure. saying that if I have apartment 2C and 2C has two bedrooms, I can't say, well, listen, me and my guy friends are getting bunk beds. There's four of us, and each of us have a weekend car and a daily driver, and we need eight spaces. Correct. That is not the way it operates. Okay. Right. And, you know, uh, take a step further, one Spring Street is primarily two-bedroom units. So there are more people that live at one Spring Street. And we, to, to Matt's point about RSIS, if you did an RSIS calculation on one Spring Street, there would be 350 cars required. One Spring Street only rents about 150 to 160 spaces in the garage. That's 121 units, 160 spaces, where RSIS would have had you at 350 or something. It's just, it, everything Matt is saying about urban living and the way these apartments work in urban areas is absolutely true. We see it in other cities around the state as well. Mr. It Boyd, just, can I ask one more point of clarity? Tower 3 has, will have access to one Spring Street but not reverse. Correct. I'm sorry, can you fill that in? So, the Tower 3 will have access to parking in your facility, but not in reverse. Not in reverse. Not in reverse. Correct. 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 And, and if someone is parking, you would only have a key fob for one garage, not both. So the idea of, of crossing they a... But they have both, but we only have No, 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 no. One or the other. You would have a space in one or the other, yes. State your name and spell your last name for the record. Craig Ambrock. It's A N B R O C H. Do you swear from fellow holders that nothing but the truth? I do. So I just wanted to challenge these RSI numbers. Um, you know, because you said that if you just ignore or take away all those uh, credits and you just apply the RSI numbers, so you come up with using your chart. I calculate that you come up with 312 spaces just using the RSI. Then you give us a number in another table that Spring Street plus Church Street maximum utilization is 254. 254 and 312 is 566. That's it. So we give a moment to. Crunch your numbers. <laughs> <laughs> the, the RSIS number, yes, would be 250 if we didn't have any. 250 plus 44 for the be a little housing like, plus 18. Take the retail the housing. That's 62. That's 312. It would be, yes. And right. then the, the reason, the way the calculation would work and leave us the extra spaces is that. During the day is when the current garages have their 
peak usage during the weekday. During a residential time period, residential uses do not peak during the middle of the day. So essentially, when we were saying the counts before were 254 cars, that's the middle of the weekday, when you wouldn't expect all the residents to be parking in the garage at the same time. So what we would use is a shared parking analysis. And when those 250 RSI number of people would be coming home, they would be at night when the garages are more empty today. I don't know if that went all the way around there, but basically. Well, you're, you're, you're justifying how that's, that's based on a movement of cars. Yes. I'm just giving you the broad, the broad number, the gross number, yes. which is not per, which is the correct number if you really just consider the gross number. Correct. But I'm just saying 499 right. is less than 566. I'm just giving yeah. you those numbers. And and how yeah. they move around, and that, yeah, I know that's a study, and that, you know, that Yeah, not right. everyone, the residents in the office are not all there at the same time. So that's Clearly. where the Clearly. calculation is. Clearly. Yeah. But I just wanted to have yes. that point presented that it is actually 566 bigger than 499. Right. But again, if, the, if it was all residential, I'd 100% agree with you. I agree. Yeah. I agree. It's not it's not sustainable. We're talking about theoretical possibilities. That's not the standard that this board determined when it when it approved this plan and sent it back to the council that the applicant has a right to rely on. And what we're showing is relying on that standard which we meet. There's a significant surplus. The RSIS is a great exercise, but it's theoretical. It's nothing to do with this with this project and this plan. Is there any benefit in study or in practice to assigning spaces to the existing one Spring Street folks if their garage is then going to be utilized by this new thing? There, I don't know of another garage in that. New Brunswick that does that. It's not, I mean, I don't want to be yeah. policing somebody's over my line, somebody's parking in my space. It's, it's not practical and it's not done anywhere. I don't know anywhere where it's done. State your name and spell your last name for the record, please. Barry Sherman, S-H-E-R-M-A-N. Mr. Affirm, tell the host nothing about the truth? Yes, I do. You may be here. Sam, I just want to thank you uh, publicly. I know we've had discussions about security in the garage. Your commitment to putting gates, doors, everything there publicly. And as I said to you earlier, I'm willing to work with you on logistics to make sure it works well for both parties. So thank you for publicly saying we will have better security with access to the garage and homeless won't be able to come in and people wander the streets. So that's all I want to say. Thanks, sir. Thanks. Thank you. State your name and spell your last name for the record. Yes, Charlie Cradville, K-R-A-T-O-V-I-L. Start from tell all truth and nothing but the truth. Yes, I do. Go ahead. Good evening, board members. Uh, I want to start by saying I appreciate everyone who came out to the hearing tonight. I wish every hearing had so much engagement, so many good questions, and uh, so much dialogue. Um, I have a few questions of my own. Could I ask what is the anticipated cost to rent one of the one bedroom units? Uh, hasn't been determined yet, but something similar uh, to the market in the area, but hasn't been determined yet. Okay, how about the timeline for construction? Is there a target to start, complete? So, nothing's been planned yet. We don't have construction drawings. Normally, once we, you know, finish this stage, get past this stage, then we would start that part. But, uh, you know, uh, the housing authority has uh, certain timelines in place. And There's a timeline in the redevelopment agreement. Uh, we just don't recall off the top of our heads what it is, but it's probably 24 months right. to be able to commence construction and then 24 to 36 months after that. Okay, so... Maybe look. not that, quite that long, maybe four years total. Right, so being 2023, we're talking about yeah. no completion until 2027 or so? Maybe 26. How about the staging for the project? It's such a small site. Uh, is there a plan to erect a crane on the site, where would that go? And how would that impact the neighboring properties? So, so none of the construction site logistics have been uh, determined yet. Again, we don't have construction drawings yet, but of course it is a tight site. 
Yeah. Um, a lot of sites in New Brunswick are tight sites. One Spring Street was an incredibly tight site, uh, as was the Aspire. So it has not been determined yet, but we would have to work on it and talk to some of the neighbors and, and work things out. You will need a credit, right? Presumably. Of um, will the applicant be seeking a long-term tax exemption? Yes. Okay. Um, I guess there was talk of the significant vacancy in one Spring Street garage. Heard some numbers of occupancy being like 150, 160. What's the total number of spots in that deck? I was never sure if it was 387. 387. 387 for the existing deck, and this would be a 112. Right. And how many are we losing with the deck that would be raised? <clears throat> About 40. Okay, so much like smaller. Um, does the developer have any projects where they successfully build affordable units from scratch in New Brunswick? Yes. Okay, where would those be? The Aspire. The Aspire, yes, okay. Um, I wanted to ask about, and it did come up, the, I would call it the world's smallest sidewalk, the little uh, you know, Spring Street sliver there. We couldn't, get, couldn't possibly get any smaller at this point, it's just a curb. But I wanted to, to clarify that it's now going to be much bigger, so it's a 10 foot total from the 14 foot. The narrowest part is 14 foot. At the narrowest part, so it would be 14 to There's the pull in, and that's 14, and then out there is probably closer to 20. <coughs> And yeah, I think. And better lighting, too. <laughs> good, good. Well, I, I think those are all of my questions, so I thank you for hearing me answer. Any other members of the public wish to make a comment or question? Seeing none, I do again thank everyone for the participation and the comments. We do appreciate hearing from you. and. Barry, I don't think you have to have an HOA meeting this month. <laughs> you've heard, you've heard everything. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, open it up just for any board discussion. I, I just want to kick it off with one point. I mean, I, I hear folks what you're saying about retail, but I I do disagree. I, I, I too wish I had a supermarket or a dry cleaner to go to, and I will tell you that to attract better retail, we need to have more retail. So I'm glad to see that there's a retail space, and I look forward to a use in that that will help us to get additional retail attracted to New Brunswick. And I think that that's um, on the cusp, I hope. So that was my point. Anyone else? Okay. Do I have a motion? I have to Oh, condition, sorry. And, and before I do that, I would just uh, can, uh, ask what the waivers are one more time. There were four of them. And I, I think I got park install dimensions. I got a backup aisle, I think. And I think there's two more. Somebody parking stall size, the aisle width in the parking area, the two-way the two driveway width. Two-way driveway width. And the landscaping buffer, buffering around the perimeter of the. Okay. Got it. All right, so I'll already finish. All right, so should the board act favorably, uh, the following conditions shall apply. Compliance with the terms of the city engineer report dated September 18, 2023. Submission of all necessary easements and, and or process access agreements for review and approval by the board attorney and the city engineer prior to the filing of the same. Uh, payment of a site performance bond in an amount reviewed and approved by the city engineer. Submission of a site inspection escrow deposit for engineering inspection fees in an amount calculated pursuant to Title 16.24.160. Uh, water and sewer connection fees. Payment of all water and sewer connection fees pursuant to Titles 13.04 and 13.08. Uh, issuance of a road opening permit from the city engineer if required. Compliance with the terms of the Big Mill Planning Report dated September 28, 2023. Uh, uh, let's see. I don't remember if this one came out. Was there a, did, they, did we discuss the tree contribution? I feel yes. like it came out. Yeah. Yes, it was yes. in So, uh, mandatory monetary contribution to the city's tree preservation trust fund in the amount to be required by Title 8.48. 
uh, planning review escrow funded for all anticipated post approval reviews, payment of all other fees due to the city of Brunswick related to development or use of this project, uh, payment of all outstanding taxes and water and sewer fees, Middlesex County Planning approval, Middlesex County Planning Board approval or waiver, DNR Canal Commission approval or waiver, Freehold Soil Conservation District approval or waiver. Uh, submit engineering site plan to comply with any changes required by the planning or engineering memos or plan amendments offered at the hearing. Submit architectural plans to comply with any changes required by the planning or engineering memos or plan amendments offered at the hearing. Um, we've got all utilities and other site improvements to be maintained by the applicant at their sole expense. All on-site utilities to be constructed underground. All temporary encroachments into the public right away shall require city council approval. All construction staging shall be done in on site unless encroachment allowing into the public right of way is approved by city council. Streets shall be kept clean of sediment and debris. The applicant shall cause this streets to be cleaned if directed to do so by the director of public works. Tracking paths shall be installed at all construction exits. Replacement of damaged streets, curbs, and sidewalks as per the direction of the city engineer. Uh, design waivers for park installed dimensions, backup aisle width, two way driveway width, and landscaping planting requirements. Motion to approve based on the aforementioned uh, uh, conditions. Uh, hold on. I should be fast. Uh, that was Chris. Was nice. Okay. Um, Galitza Checo? Yes. Carlina Melendez? Yes. Suzanne Sakura Ludwig? Yes. Priscilla Tella? Yes. Diana Lopez? Yes. Zach Wright? Yes. Bob Cardica? Yes. Matt Ferguson? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.